The Luniverse by Rainbow Double Dash, Season 2, Episode 1, Chapter 2, Quality of Mercy. Grogal made his skulls in a Texas plane, Luna said, as he continued relaying the story of Tamerlan to the Six Elements of Harmony. She shook her head and made a sleeping motion with one wing. Slaughtered ten thousand beings single hoofedly, all as part of his mad quest to achieve immortality. He felt no remorse for what he had done. He was a monster through and through. Even after my sister and I had broken through his every defense, exhausted his magical power. Even as he was helpless before us, there was not a trace of regret. I knew that death would have been too mild a punishment for him. Caratop shivered a little at the way Luna said the last line. Though the princess had been telling a rather chilling narrative the whole time regardless. She looked around the living room at Trixie's house, to each of her friends. Lyra was following all of this with rapt attention. The way her horn would occasionally glow slightly, she says that she really wished she had a parchment and quill to write down everything Luna had said. She was, after all, a bard at heart. Trixie, too, was listening intently to the story, seemingly just as interested in this forgotten history of the world. Cherry Lee and Raindrops helped, meanwhile, with as unnerved as Carrot Top measures she did. Grogar sounded like a monster. It was true, but it was difficult to imagine any being so monstrous that death seemed too mild. Even Corona, the tyrant's son, had only ever faced banishment. Though then again, her crimes had been substantially more limited than Grogar's were being described as. And her infamy was born more from her story being one of madness and betrayal than simply having a high body count. Dizzy too, however, stood up. Too mild, she demanded. What did he do instead? Luna grimaced, tucking her wings slightly at her side. Drop him in shadow, Luna said, holding up a hoof as her horn glowed. Above her hoof, an illusion of a planet appeared, spinning in place. As the six points watched, a dim fog seemed to creep off the globe, forming a second, darker, indistinct globe of its own that didn't quite fully detach from the spear of its horizon, passing through it. Shuttle is not quite another world, but nor is it our world. It is like an echo, a realm of mist and fog and darkness. It is the foy of life, to my knowledge, but it is not uninhabitable. Time does not pass in shadow as it does in our world. Hundreds of years here translate to only a few weeks or months there. Rather than slaying Grogar, my sister and I exiled him, and the fallen city of Tamlon into shadow. There he would remain, as the world slowly forgot about him. His magical power was more than enough to create food and water for himself, to keep himself alive, while here in our world we would slowly forget about him. Having been denied physical immortality, I and my sister sought to deny him even the immortality of infamy. Luna flicked her huff, dispelling the illusion of world and shadow. Unlike with Tirak, or other early threats to Equestria, the world, we would build no monuments to the defeat of Grogar. It was not entered into any history texts. Knowledge of what Grogar did was passed by word of mouth only. And even that, Celestia and I knew, would fade over time. Eventually, he would be forgotten by all, save we two. When that day finally came, we would bring him back from shadow, and let him know he had been forgotten. Then, he could die. Dizzy blinked rapidly at that. Taking a step towards Luna with eyes that were surprisingly hard, the sight being walled. Yes, that's horrible, she said. It's torture, it's cruel. This is cruel as he had been. Luna scowled for a moment at Dizzy's accusation. But after a moment, her gaze softened. The morals and expectations of the time were different, she admitted. The concept of an eye for an eye was considered just and fair. I am a product of the times just as much as any of you are. Even 500 years ago, I doubt very much you would have checked my decision. She held up a hoof before Ditsy could speak again. But times change and I change with them, I promise. That's just why I'm here today, when possibly. Luna looked from Ditsy to the rest of the group. Grogar was banished into shadow by the elements of harmony, she explained. But after madness claimed my sister, and I was forced to banish her into the sun using the elements, Corona and I both lost our connection to them. The result of that was that Tamerlan returned nearly a thousand years ago. I sensed his return, however, and so personally balanced it and Grogar back into shadow again. But then, 
five hundred years later and returned a second time. Once again, I balanced it. It would seem that even if I could duplicate the scale of the elements act, I could not duplicate their length. Left on its own, Tamalon will keep returning once every five hundred years until either it remains or the elements pass forever once more. Of greater concern, however, is the nature of the elements themselves. When Kamalon returned and U6 used the elements on her, the elements had a different result of their name when I used them. Karana was weakened instead of banished, Luna nodded. Exactly. But this raises questions. One in particular, why? The six looked between each other at that. Kiritop never wondered before, nor at any pony else it seemed. Maybe they just work differently for us, Charlie suggested. I know I wanted to butt Karana back into the sun. Me too, Raydrops noted. Well, maybe they don't work right for us for a specific reason, Kiritop said, visiting a little. They decided not to voice her other concern. The elements didn't work because Corona had grown too strong for her to ever be banished again. Maybe because we're just making the ponies instead of alicorns. We can't control them. Perhaps, Luna said. Sosie shook her head. I do not believe that to be the case, however. And certainly in the past, the elements always seemed to do whatever it was that Celestia and I needed them to. But not always what we wanted. She looked at Trixie, raising an eyebrow. You also experienced with that, yes? The other five points looked at Trixie, who buzzed slightly, tapping her hose together. Right, she said, waving her hoof a little. When I went to that other Equestria, I got all the elements of harmony together and put them on that world's version of you guys, out there making them think they were you, because I thought that Celestia of that world was Corona. I wanted to fix everything, and the elements over there fixed everything by breaking the spells I put on every pony. She grimaced. Not my funniest hour. You didn't know, Trixie, Caratop reasserted her friend. If you'd been right, it would have been very heroic. I wasn't right, though, Trixie said with a sigh. No, but the wall's no lasting harm, Luna noted. She grinned slightly. Necessit, equal side of the alicorn notwithstanding. The point is that the elements have long been a force of magic and mystery. I have respected that mystery in the past before. But the imminent return of Tamalon presents an opportunity that, in light of Corona still being at large, cannot be ignored. Caritop Grimace said that. She so suspected something like this might have been the case, as soon as Luna had mentioned using the elements on Grogar originally. She didn't like it then, she didn't like it now either. You want to conduct some sort of experiment, she eyes. Did she blink again? Look at you, Luna, wants a disbelief in for confirmation. Luna met her gaze slightly for several long moments before nodding. Yes, the princess confirmed. No, Dizzy responded, dabbing one of her hose on the floor. I'm not. I'm not, go I'm not going to use Grogar for an experiment, no matter what he did. He spent 2,000 years past. Isn't that enough? By any estimates, Luna said, raising a huff. From his perspective, it has also been, in fact, only about 400 days, barely more than a year. I respect Dame Dizzy. So you are right now demonstrating exactly why it is you have earned your allowance. Grogar deserves no kindness. A close friend of mine thinks that every pony deserves a little kindness, Dizzy said sternly. I happen to agree with her wholeheartedly. I'm not saying you should forgive Grogar or anything, but if he's going to be in prison, it should be here, in Equestria. You shouldn't lock him away in a, an entire empty world. I agree, Raydrop said, standing up and stepping over to her fellow Pegasus. Using one wing to press Ditsy's own as a sign of camaraderie. So she gave a hard look to Luna. We have jails and prisons here, your majesty. Put him in one of those. I don't care how magical he is. You're stronger. You can cook something up, or or if you can't, just execute him and be done with it already. Don't make him suffer. Luna looked at the two pig's eye, before smiling slightly and biting her head. As I said, she noted, time's changed. I'm glad that they seem to have changed for the better. That even a monster like Rogar can earn some measure of sympathy from you. She looked at Dizzy in particular, her face growing slightly more stern. However, learning the extent of the element's power is important for the safety of Equestria. The elements may be able to place a more permanent barrier on Tamanon than I can. However, I can pass between this world and shadow with some effort, but not much. Dame Dizzy, would you consent to using the elements in an attempt to banish Grogar once more to shadow? If I give you my word as princess, I will retrieve Grogar from there, and be brought back to Equestria for imprisonment. 
Dusty sipped it a little. Evidently, so he had thought the banishment was an all-or-nothing affair, considering the possibility of simply seeing if it was possible, then immediately reversing it. I mean, she said, sitting from one hoof to the next, wings twitching it as her teeth to see eyed Luna. You promise? Luna spread her wings and placed one hoof to her heart. I swear, Dame Ditsy. No, she looked at Ditsy. On the start, there will be no modern trial. I will be invoking my royal authority on this manner, and I will not be charmed. He will be returned to the question and imprisoned for the remainder of his life. Terry pleaded that, eyes wide. No trial, she asked. I kind of assumed there would have been one, if only for show. Can you do that? Luna grimaced. If I feel a threat or benefit to a question is great enough, yes. I am legally endowed to bypass any law I need to and act as an autocrat. The withful, unrepented slaughter of some 10,000 Tamerlan by blackest magic makes Grogar a great enough threat that he should have no opportunity for freedom. Her face darkened. I have only once, in thousands of years serving as ruler of Equestria, and folks such an authority as I am now. That being when I officially cast down my sister as co-ruler and established Equestria as a monarchy rather than a diarchy. I hope this impresses upon you the threat that I feel Grogar represents. It's certainly different, Caratop. It was only two months ago that the six of them risked high treason itself to try and convince Luna to take a more active role in equestrian affairs. At the end of the event, Luna revealed, or more like slip, how greatly she feared being seen as a tyrant to place herself above equestrian laws. For Luna to be so adamant about Grogar, Caratop couldn't help but shiver. Dizzy shivered as well, likely for the same reason. So for long, one was a silence, however. She nodded. Okay, she said. Okay, then, I'll help. Luna didn't smile. She knew that Dizzy was only picking for what to her seemed like the best of many bad choices. She did not, however, and went to the remaining elements. All the rest of you in agreement, she asked. At length, each nodded in a confirmation. Luna fluttered her wings as he stood. Then we should leave immediately, she declared. Tabanon awaits. Luna had said immediately, and meant it. There was a private train parked at the Ponyfield Station awaiting them, and inside half an hour, they were off for Lariat, in the western provinces of Broadcordia that bordered the Sea of Tranquility's northwest. By the time they reached Lariat, night had fallen. This had, however, been anticipated by Luna, who had several hotel rooms already reserved for the six of them. Sympathetic to the fact that though she was nocturnal by her very nature, the six elements were not, and would want to get some sleep before going to the Haunted Isle. The following day, they had set out not long after dawn. Not so early for Tearly, Ditsy, or Caratop, but rather than Raindrops, Trixie, and Lyra were where used to. The latter two were essentially dead on her hose, as Luna had taken them to the boat that would be conveying them to Tamerlan, the Royal Equestrian ship Windsong, which so much like the other ships of the line built in the past hundred years, with a thick wooded hull supporting three masts billowing with the blue sails preferred by the Equestrian Navy. The RES Windsong, however, and an additional feature that none of the ponies ever seen on a naval ship. A pair of steam chimneys that, once the ship got underway and cleared Lariat's harbor, began to portray the ship into the wind with little difficulty. The captain of the ship had informed them they would be at Tamerlan within two days, much faster than a pure sailing ship would have been able to reach the island, given that the wind was not expected to be with them at all during the trip. Hmm. One twain, two twain, Mark Twain! Y'all called? Oh, I wanted your autograph. No problem. Oh, you were waiting for that joke. You wanted to do that joke, didn't you? Did you? Yes, Trixie. I did. Unfortunately, this still gave Caratop two days to discover a new fact about herself. So you got horribly, horribly seasick. <laughs> Caratop groaned as he looked at her head from over the railing. Eyes closed and coughed at the mouth. Lara grimaced as he ran a hoof across Caratop's back. Rubbing it gently to help her along. Better? She asked. Caratop responded, freezing her face for a moment, then throwing her head over the side again. She's bad, but didn't throw up at least. This. this is punishment for Luna for slapping a doll in her face. Lara smiled at the absurdity of statement. You think Luna's that cruel? Yes, I th think she- Oh, stars, I think she is. On, on this spot. And I do not agree with the tax code addendum from two years ago. 
Demic Unicorn couldn't help but chuckle as she leaned on the railing, looking at the sea. You're just hoping that Luna strikes you dead, so you don't have to deal with being seasick anymore, aren't you? Shut up! Lara obliged, more than willing to let Caratops change in temperament slide, given how green she was looking. Lara still didn't get seasick at all, and been able to enjoy the past few days. She wished Bon Bon could have been here, rather than back at Ponyville. Up until today, the skies had been host to only small, puffy clouds that blocked the sun without bringing any rain. The sea had been placid as well. The rocket of wind song hardly nobles to her, just after a few days, even if Caratop noticed it acutely. Lyra found herself wishing that Wingsong hadn't had seen power at all. The step had forced her to rely on slower sails, just so she could enjoy the cruise more. But then again, she had gathered from Princess Luna that Grogar would be free soon. If they weren't to dare to deal with him, it would be officially a bad thing. Today, the final day of their travel to Tamerlan, and a sole exception to the generally pleasant weather. A fog appeared several hours before dawn and refused to go away. Wingsong had several Pegasi crew members, even now, working to dispel the fog ahead of the ship. Something Raindrops had volunteered to help out with. Every now and then, Lyra caught sight of her friend flying along at the head of the ship with the white uniformed crew members. A more concern to Caratop was that the seas had gotten a little rougher. Not dark enough for Lyra to know, to any extent, but it meant that Caratop had spent all morning on the deck, leaning over the side of the ship and wishing Luna would hear some of the rude things he was saying so she could be banished to the sun, which presumably didn't sway as much. Part of Lyra was concerned about the fog, more specifically, the fact that it seemed to rise as they were approaching Tamerlan itself. Why did it need training or talent as a storyteller to suspect the connection between the two? Of course, Lyra did have both training and talent as a storyteller, and that training and talent couldn't help but think otherwise. How's he doing? Well, Trixie's voice asked from behind Lyra. She glanced over her shoulder to acknowledge Trixie with a nod, and looked back at the mist clothed wire. Better, actually. Lyra nodded, host still rubbing Caratop's back. Though I can't tell if that's because he's getting used to the water, or is he can't keep enough down to throw back up later. Tracy settled down next to Caratop, placing her own reassuring hoof on the mare's back. We're nearly there, she said. The sea's just a little rougher now, because we're in shallower water. Really? Caratop asked, without looking up. Absolutely. Trixie said, though at a glance from Lyra, she simply tried to put one hoof to her lips. Lyra nodded, Caratop didn't see. Trixie looked back to Caratop. Do you want me to ask if Luna could try flying you back once we're done with Tamerlan? If anything, Caratop became even grayer at the thought. Lyra looked at Trixie. She was losing when Luna transported us to the other equestria as well. She nodded. I think Caratop just can't handle traveling anywhere except on Huff. What oh, train? Caratop was said meekly in her own defense. Lara just chuckled to pat Caratop's back. She looked at Trixie. So, do you think Princess Luna would mind if I wrote something up about all this? Trixie asked Lyra. It's not really that great a story, she nodded. The brave knights of the realm came to Tamblon after 2,000 years just to see what was up. Grogar was there, they banished him again, buy him back and hauled him off to jail. The end. Lyra chuckled a little. <laughs> well, you put it like that, she said. I was thinking of writing a piece or two on Tamerlan itself. The princess's plan worked. I knew that Tamerlan would be considered haunted, but I didn't have any names that I didn't know about its history. Grogar has probably been basically forgotten. Sounded like he deserved it, Lyra nodded. Yeah. But then there's more to it than that, Lyra said. Is it just Tamerlan that's been forgotten? It's all those beings that live there, too. The Tamerlan. From what Lewis said, it sounded like it was a pretty interesting place at one point. This whole history should be forgotten about because of how bad its end was. Or really, especially how bad it was. That's not the kind of thing to be forgotten about. Just to make one man suffer. Tracy grimaced, but nodded. Yeah. So he agreed. I get that. Land ho! The two unicorns and one earth point glanced down at brow from where the call had come. The call would probably come from the crow's nest. With the pig side of the crew sleeping ahead and passing up through the fog, they had been first to spot the island. One pig in particular, raindrops, flew right up to the three of them landed on deck, 
with a slight thud, seeking itself. She was wet from the fog, but for raindrops, this was a good thing. There was a smile on her face, and her movements were a little easier, more fluid than they normally were. Fog breaks up ahead, she said. Then about a quarter mile, well, you'll see. Tracy and Lyra got up, trying towards the bow of the ship. He'll be careful to follow along. By the time they reached Twin Song, Tearly and Dizzy came up on deck and joined them. The fog seemed to part suddenly, like reaching the edge of the cloud. The water beneath them was a dark, impenetrable blue and choppy, while the sky overhead was clear of any cloud. But that was not what drew the attention of the six friends. Instead, their eyes were drawn to the Isle of Tamberlon. They were approaching from the island's northeast. They could see Sire Cliffs, rather than the sandy beaches they had been told dominated the southern end of the island. The cliffs were bleached white marble. From there, they could see that their tops were crested with trees, twisted pines, and curled deciduous trees with bending, twisting branches that almost seemed to be forming a natural wall. The cliffs gave way to the west, as Woodsong angled to travel perpendicular to the island, revealing a wide, semicircle cove that gave way to a marsh choked with reeds and grasses. Rising from one of the drier sections of the marsh, Lyra thought since he could see the remnants of the stone structure, but it was so overgrown it half sunk. Past the cove, the cliffs of the island rose up again, stretching for miles westward and curving out of the sight. Lyra frowned. Is this it? she asked. I guess, Shirley said, leaning forward a little and sighing. For a haunted abandoned island, it doesn't really look all that bad. Kirtar shook her head. There's malaria on that moss, she said. I bit my lane. Kiritop threw her head over the side of the ship again, retching. Dizzy reached her first, holding her until she was fizzing her drive heaves. Then looked to her friends. I think it, it can go ashore now. Unfortunately, the answer had been no. Neither Luna nor the captain of Windsong wanted to make their landing on Terra on, on a mosquito infested swamp. It was far too distant from their goal to remain in the city proper. Still, it took only an hour of sailing before Winsong reached a more favorable harbor. This one a cove like the previous one, but surrounded by a rocky beach and pine forests instead. Wingsong had too big of a draft to sail into the cove itself, but he did drop anchor inside of it. He prepared a lifeboat to carry Cheerley, Caratop, Lyra, and Trixie to the island. While Tizzy and Raindrops elected to fly, Luna propelling the lifeboat along with her telekinesis. Why aren't any of the crew coming with us? Cheerley asked as he pulled the element of laughter from her muscle banks. And sighed a little before slipping it on, sucking in a breath as he did. Each artifact of man's he can may have been, it was also a little tight around the throat, thanks to Charlie's coat being a little thicker and easier than usual. Luna looked down at her as he kept the boat moving. Grogaz is extremely challenged and extremely desperate. She noticed he guided the boat into the cove, with Tavalon having returned twice before in the past. He's likely to prepare for his return in some way. In case something grows wrong, the fewer points you all have to protect, the better. Tearly supposed you could understand that, and smiled. Guess that's what happens when I sign up to be a knight. She nodded, tugging at her element a little. She couldn't help but wonder if the element of laughter was tight, because it somehow found it funny. If so, its sense of humor left something to be desired. The boat made landfall within a few minutes. No point even tried to beat Carrot Top to being the first off. She leaped into the four-inch deep water without hesitation, and galloped straight up to the rocky shore. Legs were shaking, and she herself finally swayed a little, unused to being on solid ground after two days at sea. But she indulgently brightened. <gasps> FLEE! She exclaimed, sailing down on the beach and digging her front hose into the stones beneath her. Us ponies were not meant to go to sea! I'm fine, Charlie noted, as he hovered the boat itself, leaning down and staring to the beach water for a few moments. She thought she saw some kind of fist in the wire, but it was already gone, probably started away by every pony piling out of their little boat at once. Luna sat down next to Caratop, looking at her with a frown. I'm sorry, she said. I didn't know you suffered from seasickness. Caratop had jumped slightly at Luna's apology. It's fine, she insisted. I mean, I didn't even know myself. I've never even been on a boat before. She looked past Luna and had the forest, but then... Um, I think I see some plants I might be able to use to mix something up to help for the return trip. Do you think after we're done here, I could have a few hours to look around? Luna nodded. The cheerily chuckled. Be careful. She noted. This is an evil, haunted island, remember. 
You don't want to make all the ghosts here mad that you're stealing from the garden. Kiritop looked at Shirley with narrow eyes. I'll certainly not mind, she said, stood up. She had a little more to serve her host now. She tried out to the beach at the edge of the forest. Considering a few of the smaller brushes, and a few moments before beginning to bite the off a few, and now I'm starving, she said between gulps. Charlie chuckled again, and even Luna smiled. You'll have to eat as we walk, the princess said, spreading out her wings and horn calling lightly. The city of Tabanon, or where it used to sit in any event, is about an hour's trot from here, and I sense Tabanon will be returning not long after that. Garrett nodded, even as he tore a particularly juicy looking stem. Followed Luna after her friends, muzzling it along as she cantered along a natural road through the forest, though the hint of what looked like to be a case of a worked stone poking up from the dirt and fallen leaves, since it had once might actually have been a cobblestone road. A look for raindrops. Caretop held out some of the plants he was eating. What's them? She asked. It's pretty good. Raindrops sighed the plant. No thanks, she said. I don't eat food unless it's been washed first. Sorry. Trixie was nearly picking his raindrops, however, and tried to bite. She chewed thoughtfully for a few minutes. Needs stressing. Rice, maybe. Her friend stared at her a moment. He said a blinking surprise. What? Trixie asked. Just ranch dressing? That's it? Lyra asked. Not chili sauce? Not chocolate? Dizzy put in. Not shrimp? Charlie asked with a bit of a chuckle. Trixie glanced between each of them. Before realizing what they were getting at. Oh, ha, ha! She droned. That's because you ponies don't like a little variety in your food. Trix. I think you should add that ranch is just for starters. Caratop finished their impromptu meal and moved on to the second course, dipping a leaf from a nearby tree. This is really good, she noted. I'll supply still pony nips here. Luna glanced back to Caratop. I just cursed any attempts at sentiment, she so, you noted. The audience's reputation as being haunted has also played a factor. There have been a few attempts, but they always failed due to a lack of support. The remainder of their trot was done in silence, except for Caratop breaking off a leaf or, once, stuffing for about a minute to dig up a tuber. All the attempts to fill his stomach had been thoroughly emptied for the past few days. Terribly fought off the urge, born from being a teacher of school age foals. One carrot top against eating a plant she didn't know. As carrot top probably did know the exact species of each plant she was sampling. Her special talent may have been carrot farming, but back at Pawneeville, carrot top had found a decent supplement to that in the form of mixing various elixirs for those that needed them. Most specifically, a hangover cure that Terry's sister, Mary Ponce, probably could not have lived without. As the six ponies and one alicorn canter along, they saw here and there. Various signs of civilization that they once called the island home. Small glimpses through the forest, a crumbling wall that once sparked the edge of a farm, where the road rocked and might have been the head of a magnificent statue. Branches of the road they were walking it revealed that, yes, there was cobblestone beneath the dirt. Once they had even seen, through the trees, an entire abandoned town, overgrown and full of fallen walls and a complete lack of roots, a fountain filled with stagnant water. Yet, Despite the ruins, the island did not seem unpleasant at all, apart from the trees, which seemed to hold and healthy, and while twisted, hardly evil in appearance. They also saw signs of other life. A chipmunk here, a squirrel there, sparrows and crows and jays fitting amongst the trees. Was it even a coyote, or some other wild canine? Was it simply quite scampered off at the sight of the herd of ponies? Parent gave me little interest in cackling such a large game. Charlie hadn't even realized they reached the walls of the city of Tamberland itself. They were already there, the path before them suddenly ending. The walls had become completely overgrown, with only the barest hint of stone peeking through the tangle of vines and there were plants that built up between its bricks, making it look more like an overgrown cliff face than a wall. That was, at least, until Luna's horn glowed, her massive torrent was hung inside a tangle of vines and branches that even a complete fallen tree were feeling a broad white gap in the wall. The front gate, though doors had long since right, and part called a little more than rust, that dissipated at Luna's slightest touch. Walking through the walls and passing into the city itself, Terry got a sense of grim foreboding. On the other side of the walls, Tamberlon was nothing, just a solid mile of packed earth under their hooves, stretching to the other side of the walls, which appeared to form a rough square around the city. Nature, 
was a grown over and reclaimed so much of the island, right up to the walls of Tamerlan itself, and not past these walls. Even with all parties around to guide or shaped it, the wilderness had apparently taken one look into the city, seeing the complete sense emptiness, and drawing its own conclusion decided to leave it alone. It was eerie to look out from inside and see a thick, fertile living forest. To look within and see nothing but dirt, the pristine, untouched stone in the inner wall, Charlie severed despite herself. She wasn't the only one. Only break the smooth play of the city's former floor, where three large holes with some distant feet, and nearby three chunks of packed dirt. Charlie Lee glanced alone at that, and found the Alcor looking at the three imperfections and smiling, almost wistfully. When she noticed Charlie's stare, the smile dropped slightly, but didn't go away entirely. Those are my doing, she said. Waving at holes in the chunks of earth. But, well, it would take some time to explain. They aren't related to Tamanon or Grogal, however. What were they for? Charlie asked. Throwing a princess cadence, Luna said. And I start for the point, she chuckled slightly. <laughs> also, I said, it would take some time to explain, and it isn't the point. Luna waved a link, beckoning the ponies to follow. They did. Luna watched with purpose towards the point, just side of Sarah in the former city. Standing still for a moment, and looking around, checking the landmarks. Here, she said at length. Here we will be right in front of the gates of the former palace. The last two times Sabadon returned, Grogon was here, waiting. I do not see why they would be any different. The city is only a few minutes from his return now. We wait for it, then, whatever Luna was about to say, was drowned out when there was a bright flash from all around him. And the world was suddenly nothing but fire. <laughs>